I've wanted to have a full size bandsaw for quite a long time, but the main hurdle I had to overcome was the space constraints that I have. Once I decided I could modify the tool carousel, building my own bandsaw was an easy choice. How about we start with a few sample cuts and then I'll give you all the details on its construction and capacities. All right, we're ready to do some cutting. So when the blade guide is all the way up, we're at eight inches or about 20 centimeters. If I remove the guard, I get a little over an inch in additional height. And if you remove the blade guide and everything, it's nine and three quarters or almost 25 centimeters. First up is a nice hard board of maple. This guy is seven and a quarter. This is a one by eight. So seven and a quarter inches wide. Let's give it a shot. Let's try something else. All right, next up I've got a quarter inch piece of steel. This is 6.35 millimeters. As you can see, I've switched out to a metal cutting blade and I'm gonna aim the camera a little bit this way to make sure you can see uh, what kind of power we're using as we cut the steel. How about a half inch? As you can see, that cut is nice and smooth. The blade is nice and cool. It's not warm at all. It's easy to hold my fingers on it. I started this build by purchasing Matthias's 16 inch bandsaw plans. I'll put a link to his website in the description. And because of that, I'm gonna mostly focus on the changes that I made, the things that I did different, because I feel like that's probably what you're mostly interested in. Starting with the wheels, I did make the wheels both top and bottom thicker, but more significant than that, I changed the hub design. In Matthias's plans, he calls for a bearing like this, rather robust uh, one inch bearing that requires a press fit. Now, the concern there is that if you don't have a very tight press fit, the bearing could work itself loose over time. To alleviate that concern altogether and not have to worry about having uh, exactly the right fit. I drilled the hole with a portion of it that I knew would give me a very snug fit on a needle bearing, which is the other change that I made. I used a needle bearing instead of uh, a roller bearing. It was what you might call a locational fit. I could still grab the bearing and slide it out, but it had almost no perceptible play in it when you pushed it in. And then I covered that with another plate, which is this guy. It's three quarters of an inch thick. I screwed this down and then balanced the whole wheel. This hasn't given me any problems. It was very easy to make and I prefer that over trying to get a good press fit uh, in both wheels on both sides. And then over here, we've got a piece of sheet metal that I took out of a printer. It happened to have pretty much the ideal shape for a blade guard and I ended up using that instead of trying to bend my own sheet metal. That was a nice convenient piece of steel and I had, to make, I had to make almost no modification to it. So that led to some other changes. So let me turn this guy around for you. Now, once I decided to use this piece of sheet metal as the blade guard, 
that made me rethink the whole design of the upper arm. What I ended up doing was using this steel rectangular tubing and then I filled that in with hardwood. As you can see, this is just a piece that I cut off and that wood, the piece that's in there is a very snug fit. That makes this piece really light, but extraordinarily stiff for its size. Up here, this clamping is also slightly different. I never quite finished this handle. I should have sanded that paper off and put some poly on it or something, but never quite got around to it. As you can see, I went back later and cut a notch out right here. And that just allows me to get about another inch of resaw height. This part of the plans is pretty much the same. And I drilled two holes for the Allen wrenches that I use to loosen and adjust the blade guides. Looking at the lower compartment now, you can see my drive wheel. This guy has two extra layers of three quarter inch plywood on the back, which is where I have turned the two pulleys. And that's because I needed two belts in order to handle the horsepower from the motor. So this guy is extra thick, but otherwise it's made like a top wheel. It's got needle bearings inside that are encased in the wood. The trunnion I changed slightly. I made this guy about a half inch thicker. And also this whole beam has a piece of steel flat bar encased in it, both this way and this way. And I will show you a picture of that in just a minute, but that gives me an extraordinary increase in strength and stiffness in the table. But more importantly than that, you'll see that there's no knob here. There's just a lock nut. And that's because I actually have no intention of tilting this table. If I want to tilt the table and cut at an angle, I would use my scroll saw. And therefore, looking back on it, I think I would skip the trunnion because that's the hardest part to make and would just make a very sturdy flat table to go here and bolt it straight to the body. I wouldn't make the trunnion. But again, that's personal preference. If you want to be able to tilt your table, then you certainly need to go with this. It's a nice design for what it is. I just don't need it. One other benefit to removing the trunnion, of course, if you don't need one, would be it greatly simplifies the door design. If you remove the need for this uh, trunnion, then you could simplify the door and make it so that one piece will keep all the dust inside. Moving over to the motor now, I've got a four horsepower motor driven by a VFD. And like I said before, there are two belts in there driving the wheel. I've also gone back and added this case uh, this case came as sort of an afterthought, which is why this hole is cut out here for the nose of the motor. There's really no risk of getting anything caught on that. I primarily put this Lexan on top. Lexan is much tougher than plexiglass, by the way. But I put this cover on here just to make sure my kids don't like stick their finger in the belt or anything like that. Otherwise, I wasn't terribly worried about covering it up. But it does help keep the dust inside and it keeps anybody from sticking their hands in there or makes it much more difficult to do so. And that's all I was really trying to accomplish with this box. Over here, we have the digital display. This switch actually activates the saw and this switch gives everything power. Right here, we've got the RPM of the wheel. As you can see, voltage coming in. The current is very low right now. We're just powering the displays and then the amount of power being used. I don't look at this very much when I'm actually cutting on the saw, but it is nice for troubleshooting if you are good indicators here. If you're using more power than you would normally use, it probably means it's time to replace the blade because your, mo your motor is working harder than it should. 60 hertz indicates 3,000 feet per minute. 5 to 10 hertz is the wheel speed I need for cutting steel. And I can just quickly get it down to that range and I know that I'm at a safe speed for cutting steel. I can go below that all the way down to 1 hertz, but in general I don't need to. So let me show you the VFD. This is a five horsepower VFD. I do come back and blow the dust out of this guy and periodically clean this whole region up. But the plan in the future is to uh, fully encase this with filters. I just haven't gotten around to that because I want to redesign this whole station. So I don't want to get too far into building something around this until I decide what else I want to do with this whole area. I don't think I mentioned this before, but this VFD is 240 volt single phase in and it outputs three phase. The motor I have is a three phase motor. I did end up making the frame quite a bit thicker. And again, that was just personal preference. I don't necessarily think it's required, 
but I had the material and I knew it would add more strength. So that's what I went for. All of the wires from the motor and the VFD come up through this tubing into this box. All the grounding and all the connections are done inside of this box here. This cover plate on the side can be unscrewed and removed. And then I have easy access to all the connections. Again, just for troubleshooting purposes, if there's a problem. There's one more thing that I did differently that I can remember at least, and that's that handle up there. So let me take that guy off. This handle that I made is way more complicated than Matthias's design, and I am not necessarily advocating it, but somehow I ended up with this. So this is a one inch threaded rod that's got a hole drilled in the bottom of it. That is a three eighths inch coupling nut, which is rammed inside of the one inch threaded rod. There's a one inch coupling nut and then two one inch nuts on the top, which are locked together inside of this case. How I ended up doing it this way, I can't even really explain it, except that it works really well and it is way more complicated than it needs to be. As far as the construction of the bandsaw, I started by making sort of a quick and dirty jig on the workbench. It was just a bunch of squares and spacers that I screwed down to the bench, which allowed me to assemble the frame faster. After making a few adjustments, I needed to make the base of the bottom a little wider to accommodate my motor and other little things. But for the most part, I built the frame to the plans. And I also added another layer and my layers are thicker. So my bandsaw ended up being quite a bit thicker than what the plans call for. During the assembly of the frame, instead of clamping each layer, I would put all the pieces down, put clamps on, use my brad nailer to hold everything in place, take the clamps off, and immediately put the next layer on. And that allowed me to assemble the whole frame in a couple of hours, as opposed to uh, spending all day waiting for the glue to dry and then put the next layer on. Now, that sped things up. Of course, when you go to screw things into the frame, you might hit some of those brad nails. I wasn't particularly worried about that, but you may be. So anyway, it saved me some time. Thinking back on this project, there are only a couple of things I would do differently. The main one would be the trunnion, since that's not a function I actually need, and it's the most difficult part of the assembly to get correct. I would just skip that all together and make a much simpler uh, support for the table, as well as remake the door on the bottom so that it completely encloses the case without uh, letting any dust out and it's all one piece. As you can see, I didn't even bother to go back to make those other pieces. Uh, I'm probably gonna, I might do that in the future, but I haven't so far. Another thing that hopefully is obvious to you is I, I didn't crop the corners at the top. I just made it straight square because, you know, it's power tool. One more thing I would consider is going larger. When thinking about this bandsaw, I thought 16 inches was gonna be enough. And as far as resaw height is concerned, is plenty for what I do on a regular basis. In fact, I built this with less resaw height than what Matthias's plans call for. But this way, as far as clearance when cutting other pieces, I still find myself bumping into this uh, wall here on the side. And now to answer the most popular question I keep getting, and that is, how much did this guy cost? And I want to preface this by saying it depends a lot on what you already have and what you want out of the machine. For example, for me, the only wood I really had to buy was the frame itself, which I spent about $90 to $100 on. Beyond that, I really didn't have to buy much of anything else. Uh, many of these components are salvaged, like I told you before. I took this guy out of a printer. This uh, rectangular tubing came from a bed frame that I salvaged off the side of the road. And several other components are like that. Even the electrical components you see over here, those came from experiments and projects I've done at the workbench. I had already bought that stuff. It was just in a box and I took it back out and decided to incorporate it in this project here. The VFD was the other expensive component. It was about $150 that I spent on that guy. And that's because it was really important to me to have maximum torque at the lowest speed. And I also wanted to have variable speed without moving belts around. That meant I wanted to use a three phase motor with the VFD. That to me gave me the best combination of good torque at all the different speeds and digital speed control. But I do have many other motors with controllers that would have given me some speed control, but maybe not the torque that I can get from this guy. 
uh, at the lower speeds like the DC motors, for example. Or I'm pointing over here because it's one on my workbench. I think if you're gonna do a project like this, you could just as easily build this bandsaw and stick a washing machine motor on here at a half horsepower and you'd have a decent bandsaw with a good capacity. So for me, the cost was worth the investment to get the maximum power for cutting steel. But if you're not interested in doing that, then even a relatively small motor and uh, plenty of salvaged wood would get you through most of this project. You gotta be a little creative too. Uh, I have many fasteners laying around and they didn't all match what was in the plans. So I changed a few things around in order to match what I had laying around. And I would expect that you would do the same thing if you're willing to build a bandsaw at home. But if you had to buy everything according to the plans, of course you would spend a great deal more. So I leave that part up to you. If you have any questions for me that I didn't answer already, just put them in the comment section. I'll be happy to read your comments and answer your questions. I'm pretty excited about my bandsaw, but I gotta say my favorite thing is the lifetime warranty on parts and labor. Thanks for watching.